Summary of a Different Mirror by Ronald Takaki. The book's author, Ronald Takaki, finds that people don't often see him as American, even though his relatives came to the US from Japan in the 1880s. He knows that this is because of what he calls the master narrative of American history, which says wrongly that the United States is a white country. In the book, he will talk about the past of many different groups of people, including African Americans, Asian Americans, Irish Americans, Jewish Americans, Mexican Americans, Muslim Americans, and Native Americans. Even though these groups are very different, they have all been exploited and had to fight for their rights. They also all have goals and dreams for the US. Takaki thinks it's important to study how the US is made up of people from many different backgrounds in order to let America be America again, a phrase he takes from Langston Hughes's song of the same name. During the early days of English colonization of the US, William Shakespeare wrote The Tempest. This play compares colonialism to the story of Prospero, a banished Italian duke who washes up on an exotic island, and Caliban, a native of that island. Takaki thinks that Caliban might have been based on the Irish, whose land was taken over by the English and who were seen as less than human in English culture. When the English started to colonize the US, they would treat Native Americans in the same cruel and unfair way they had treated the Irish. There were times when the Native people were kind to the English newcomers, but this soon changed because the English were violent and lied to them. The newcomers killed the Native people in cruel ways, and the native people also started to die from European diseases, which they couldn't fight off because they didn't know how. The English used these deaths as a chance to grow their town. In 1619, the first black people came to the Virginia settlement. They were slaves who had probably been taken as war prisoners in Africa. For a long time, there weren't that many African people living in the Virginia settlement. But as tobacco growing grew, there was a lot of work to be done. Also, the white elite who owned land did not want white and black indentured slaves to work together. So, they set up a system of slavery that was based on race. So, there was a contradiction at the heart of the American nation-state, even though the country was based on the idea that all men were born equal, enslaved black people were only counted as three-fifths of a person in the law. Under President Andrew Jackson, the federal government forced native tribes to sign contracts and sell their land by using force. Tribes were forced to move west, which destroyed their way of life and caused a huge number of people to die. At the same time, the government built railroads through native land. During the Civil War, people in the United States had different ideas about slavery. Frederick Douglass and Martin Delaney were two great black leaders who worked hard against slavery and racism against black people. But they had different ideas about whether black people could ever be successful in the US by becoming more like white people or whether black Americans needed to make their own country separate from white people. Even after the Civil War finished and slavery was no longer legal, black people were still exploited, treated badly, and kicked out of their homes. In fact, some people said that this kind of freedom was not very different from slavery. At the same time, English colonialism and, in particular, the Great Potato Famine caused a lot of pain in Ireland, which led millions of Irish people to move to the US in the 1800s. Once the Irish got to the US, they formed close-knit networks of mutual support and workgroups that made their lives and place in American society much better. The president of Harvard, Abbott Lawrence Lowell, let them in and they started doing well as part of the middle class. When the US took over Texas and California in the middle of the 1800s, half of Mexico's land became part of the US. Suddenly, a lot of Mexicans were living in another country. They were foreigners in their own land. American laws systematically took away their land and rights, and they were made to work in a caste labor system. But they fought back hard against these wrongs, and they often went on strike. In the 1800s, a lot of Chinese people moved to the US to escape the British Opium Wars and economic pressure. They were looking for a better life in America. Most of these immigrants were men, and they were very important to the building of the Central Pacific Railroad. They were also very important in the agricultural field. 
But in 1882, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusionary Act, which made it illegal for Chinese people to come to the United States. In 1902, the act was made to last forever. In 1890, at the massacre at Wounded Knee, American forces killed hundreds of Native American men, women, and children who were not armed. While this was going on, the government kept making bad decisions that hurt Native people on purpose. At the same time, Japanese people started coming to the U.S. in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Most of them went to Hawaii, which became a U.S. state in 1900. Many of these immigrants worked in hard conditions on a sugarcane farm in Hawaii. But, like other ethnic groups, they fought back by going on strike over and over again, which helped their situation. Even so, Japanese newcomers faced a lot of racism and had a hard time being accepted as part of American society. During the same time, many Russian Jews moved to the U.S. to escape anti-Semitism and bloody pogroms. In New York City, most of these immigrants lived in the Lower East Side, where many of them worked in sweatshops as part of the clothing industry. Facing hard times, labor battles became an important part of how Jewish Americans came to see themselves. Jewish immigrants accepted the U.S. as their home country with great enthusiasm and often competed to look as American as possible. But they also had to deal with anti-Semitism in the U.S. In 1924, Congress passed a law that made it harder for Jews to come to the country. Mexican Americans were also treated badly and treated differently for a long time. One way to deal with these problems was to build barrios, which were communities of Mexican Americans where new arrivals could get help and where Mexican culture was a big part of everyday life. During the 20th century, many African Americans moved from the South to the North. This was called the Great Migration. Even though some slaves saw the North as a promised land where they could finally get away from some of the terrible effects of slavery, most slaves found life in the North hard and full of racism. A lot of black people in the North had to deal with housing and job discrimination, as well as deadly race riots. At the same time, the Harlem Renaissance, a new wave of black culture energy, swept through the area. After the attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese, Japanese Americans were rounded up and put in camps. Even though the U.S. was meant to be fighting against racism and for equality, democracy, and freedom, black soldiers were forced to serve in a separate military. Many different ethnic groups got jobs in the defense industry that paid well for the first time ever because of the war. This social change was especially important for women of color. Even though President Franklin D. Roosevelt knew that the Nazis were planning to kill all of Europe's Jews, the U.S. government did not let European Jews come to the U.S. to seek refuge. After the Second World War, there was a big push to end racial discrimination in the United States. The Civil Rights Movement, which led to the passing of the Civil Rights Act, was the major cause of this. Even though African Americans won some legal rights during this time, the black community continued to be hurt by economic unfairness and the cyclical power of poverty in the following decades. As a result of the fall of the Soviet Union and the Vietnam War, more Jews from the Soviet Union and Vietnamese people came to the United States. At the same time, violence and political instability in Afghanistan forced many Afghans to come to the U.S. After September 11, when Al-Qaeda, which is based in Afghanistan, planned and carried out a violent attack, it was hard for them to fit into American society. In the 1990s and 2000s, a big topic of conversation was what to do with the huge number of illegal immigrants in the U.S., most of whom were Mexican but many of whom were also Irish. As Takaki writes, the question is still not answered. Takaki ends the book with a reflection on his own life, which shows how the U.S. is made up of many different kinds of people. He talks about how important it is to understand the past in order to make the future better. About the author Ronald Takaki was born in Hawaii to parents who were both Japanese and American. In the 1880s, his family came to the United States and worked on sugarcane farms. Takaki was a good surfer when he was a youngster. At the College of Worcester in Ohio, where he got his BA, he was one of only two Asian Americans. Then, he went to the University of California, Berkeley, 
and got his PhD in American history. After that, he taught black studies at UCLA. When Takaki went back to Berkeley, he helped start the ethnic studies program at the university. This program was a cornerstone of the field of ethnic studies. Takaki got married to Carol Rankin, and they had three kids together. He was in his 40s when he was told he had multiple sclerosis. He stopped teaching in 2004. In 2009, when he was 70, he killed himself. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.